Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for coming along tonight. Uh, tonight we have Stephen Howard from the BRE. Stephen's going to be talking about fire performance of building envelopes. Um, the lecture lasts about 45 minutes and there will be Q&A afterwards or I mean, is it okay if we have a few questions during the sometimes? Yes. Yep, okay. I'm totally happy if, if you wish to ask questions going on the way through. Okay. Steve, Stephen has a flight to catch, so we have to, we, we can't uh, go on much more than, well, certainly he's begun by quarter to, uh, so we've an hour and a quarter maximum. Uh, emergency exits there and there. Um, mobile phones off, please, and uh, soon. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Stephen Howard. I'm Director of Fire Testing and Certification at Building Research Establishment. Um, I'm responsible for the running of the fire testing labs and certification and some of the, and some of the installer services at the BRE. Um, the presentation this evening is regarding fires and building facades. And the objective really is to provide some information on basically the UK and international experience. The regulatory framework in, the, in basically England and Wales currently and how fire testing was developed and how the current set of European and British fire tests were applied to facades. Um, this subject is pretty well covered on the internet. There's a lot of information there as well. There's some links in here. I've got some short videos. I won't play the lot because we are they can uh, drag on a bit, but we've got some videos and some other sort of like news items that's, um, that highlights the issue. Now, the first thing I'd like to, we'll get this rolling. Now, this is a um, video of a fire from the address, which was New Year's Eve 2015. I'm not going to play the lot, um, but what is it? What's a bit loud? Now the actual fire started on a balcony. Um, and just having a look on the internet, the indications are that the fire started in an electrical fault and quickly spread up the outside of the building. Now from a regulatory point of view, oh, there's all sorts of things with this fire. You've got rapid fire spread up the outside of the building. There's a huge amount of burning debris coming off. If you look at it from a firefighting, fire and rescue situation, this is actually a major incident. The comment was, has been made that the wind direction actually reduced the severity of what was going on during that fire. Um, I don't know whether the place is actually open yet, but I think uh, it was actually shut for some months following this. But that's not the only one. I mean, this is an issue that's been going on for a long, long time. We've got some history of this uh, later on, but there's a number of fires. Of particular note on there is Dijon, France, 2010. Um, that was an insulation system on the outside of the building. There was, I think there was a rubbish fire on the outside that spread to the facade. The wall was alight, the insulation material caught fire and broke in back through the fire exits. And I believe there was 10 fatalities as a result of that. Uh, the other one, which was uh, particularly severe, was Azerbaijan, May 2015. Uh, the other thing with these fires, I've had a couple of comments that not all of these are making news as well. We basically can't stop the list at the address, but I do know there's been others in the Middle East where the facades actually caught fire. And we've had a number of floors of building alight at once. And again, another link. There were 16 fatalities. And what you had here is rapid spread at the outside of the building and the actual facade material was alight and that led to 16 fatalities. Again, these links, the information behind them is all available on the internet. Um, the UK story really starts at Knowsley Heights in 1991. Um, there was a process of renovating buildings. They were looking at improving the performance of the buildings. And basically, a rubberized system was applied to the outside of the building. 
there was a deliberate fire in a rubbish chute on the ground floor and the fire quickly spread up 11 floors between the outer surface and the main wall and caused extensive amounts of damage. This was really the start of the process of looking into this um, issue on a large scale and a large scale fire spread. Another very large fire was the uh, Basingstoke. Again, fire spread across multiple floors um, up the outside of the building causing significant damage. This was one of the major insurance losses at the time. Interestingly, there was another study conducted on this building, not strictly again, uh, regarding the facade fire and the performance of the building envelope. There was also reviews of the protection of the steelwork, and that found that the steelwork protection in place actually performed remarkably well. That work was conducted by BRE as well, the investigation on that. And they didn't actually have to replace any of the steelwork due to the quality of the protection on that during that fire, which is an interesting aside. Uh, I believe it was cementitious. And this was the fire that really changed things, especially in the UK. Uh, this fire started on the fifth floor. By the time the fire brigade arrived, um, I think they had nine floors alight. So, and the attendance time of the fire brigade is pretty good. They turned up, the fire had already spread up nine floors and was beginning to penetrate its way back into the, into the building. This led to research work and again this was really when the work started on looking at this uh, aspect in greater detail and looking at changing regulations and recommendations in the UK. If you actually think about it, if you just sort of do some back of the envelope calculations, if you've got a building 180 metres high with four faces, with a footprint of say 180 metres, and you say there's a 12 millimetre layer of combustible material that covers all four faces of the building, and you have a fire incident and it in just involves just one of the faces. Just doing a few calculations, you've got huge amounts of material there. You're looking at getting on for 3,000 sheets of what in old money was eight by four material. That is a huge fire load that potentially is going on the outside of the buildings. And the above calculations are pretty conservative. 180 metres is not particularly high for a building. Empire State's 381. And as an agency, insulation systems, because we want better performing buildings, we want less energy usage, we want better air conditioning, Insulation systems going onto the outside of buildings can be 100 millimetres and can be going up from that. And we've actually seen insulation systems up at 200 mil millimetres of uh, material on the outside. There's a lot of material going on the outside of the building. And getting back to that sort of like the fire spread, the actual issue is the spread of fire up the outside of the building. It's long been known that if you have a fire in an apartment block or a block of flats or on the ground floor that you will get progressive spread up the outside, up the building. Uh, the, the fire will develop in the room, you'll break out the room via the window, you'll have flames going out the outside and it will penetrate back in the room above and there and start a secondary fire and unchecked that can progress up the outside through the building. The issue is that the fire brigades, if it's only progressing at that rate, can intervene and control those sort of fires and they do. They are particularly good, attendance times are sufficient, that is not an issue. The problem occurs if you've got fires going up the outside of the building you can turn up to multiple floors of light at the same time. And again, if your evacuation plans are based on maybe one, two floors of light, your attendance times, one, two floors of light, and suddenly you face a situation where potentially you've got 10 floors of a building of light and spreading up the outside, that is completely different. That is big risk to life safety. So what's actually happening? 
you can end up with a situation where there's actually combustible materials on the outside of the buildings. I understand from sort of like reading around that was the issue with the Azerbaijan fire, that the actual material, the decorative material on the outside was combustible. But you can also have a situation where you have cavities that have uh, combustible materials inside and that can provide a route for fire spread up the outside of the building. We've seen a move, especially on sort of like the um, higher rise, we've seen a move across from block work construction across to what they call rain screen. So the systems are built up in layers. You have an inner layer of um, plasterboard membranes, insulation materials, but a lot of these systems have cavities and are actually required to have cavities for other factors like thermal performance, ventilation, um, and issues with water and condensation to provide ventilation to clear cavities out. The issue with the cavities, once the fire actually gets into the cavity, your flame lengths extend between five and ten times your original flame length, which means your pro progression up the building can be rapid indeed. Starting fires way beyond the area of origin, going back into the building. Yep. And if you don't actually put in any cavity barriers or put any mechanism to stop that at the floor level, that will just progress all the way up. So there's a number of experimental programs conducted around 99, a little bit before, up to 2000 and beyond. Looking at the fire spread, and this includes glazed systems, building facades, but also things like insulated wall systems. And the work was conducted by Loss Prevention Council and also the Building Research Establishment, which was a fire research station at that time. And two publications were uh, produced uh, Performance of External Thermal Insulation for Walls and Fire Spread in Multi Story Buildings with Glazed Curtains, Wall Facades. These were the publications that come out of the research work that was conducted by um, the organisation I currently work for. And from that, basically testing standards were developed. Um, you've got BS 8414 Part 1, which has just been up issued to 2015. Now that looks at a performance of systems that uh, go onto block work walls, i.e. retrofit systems. And you've also got BS 8414 Part 2 2015, which is more geared towards the rain screen systems. So these systems which are built up in layers and you have cavities, uh, insulation and facade materials. Okay, I'll restrict the comments to sort of like the regulatory framework, essentially in England and Wales. I had a quick look at the Irish technical documents but I didn't get time to go through them in detail, so if I, I'll restrict my comments to what is done um, in England and Wales currently. There's two sets of guidance, basically, one for domestic dwellings, uh, it comes to two volumes, one for domestic dwellings and one for others. And essentially, the guidance um, is contained within section B4 under external fire spread. <coughs> In summary, what it actually says is for buildings with a storey over 18 metres, any insulation and filler material should be A2 or better. Now, A2 is a defined, is limited combustibility and is a defined fire testing classification. It also says cavity barriers and fire stopping guidance needs to be followed. So getting back to the illustration with the fire going up the cavity, we want to prevent that, so cavity bag <laughs> barriers go in. Or test the complete system as a whole to BS8414. So the actual recommendations are performance based. So for external walls, you've got essentially two choices. You can go for your small scale classifications small scale testing and go for your A1 and A2 classifications. And the reason why this is deemed acceptable as a recommendation is the testing data 
actually provides enough information to say that you will not get uncontrolled fire spread if your materials are A2. The testing and classification system evaluates the product as a whole. Basically, when you have an A2 or A1 classification, the way it's tested assesses the whole product. And this is a critical element of the test. In particular, there's a thing called a bomb test, which is ENISO 1716, is where you burn small quantities of the material in oxygen so you get an actual value for the heat release. So what they're actually saying is you can limit fire spread by fundamentally limiting the combustion of the products that you use in the facade. And for multi-layer systems, so if you've got paints, renders, meshes, insulation material, you can use the same approach, but you would test each one. And you do a calculation to work out that you're still within the A2 limits or A2 classification. Important difference when you get to B, C and D classifications. Your B, C and D consist of two tests. One is a single burning item, commonly known as the SBI, and the other is a single flame test, small flame test. In both of these cases, the flame source is applied to the outer surface of the sample under test. So if I skip, skip back one. So in the case of A1 and A2, and this is the European classification, you're testing the whole product. When you go to B, C and D, you are looking at the product as it's applied to the wall. So the flames are actually put on the outside surface of the uh, item under test. And the samples that we use for testing are representative for final construction. Alternatively, you can go for the large scale test. Now, we've got testing facilities, the cladding testing facilities located at BRE Watford. We've got indoor testing facilities, and there's four faces that we use for, for testing of these systems. The actual systems under test are built onto an L-shaped structure. Uh, the structures that we've got are just over nine metres high, and it gives you basically three storeys above the combustion chamber. There's a wing wall as well. We don't test just a flat system. The configuration of your test system is in an L shape. And this is because you get effects as the flames actually go up into the, uh, ju at the junction between your wing and your main face. And you can actually get the fire climbing that way further than it would just up the main face. So, our si so your system is actually built as it would be in a building. Again, up to sort of like nine and a half metres. And we run two sorts of tests. Part one, where the systems are actually built onto a masonry structure. And here, can you, here you can see sort of like the aft aftermath of a test. Um, you've got your L shaped structure with your hearth at the bottom, and basically you see the floor edges or the remains of some fire stopping. And the test method was developed to address insulation systems installed on masonry structures. The systems are fully instrumented when we test. So what we'll actually do is put temperature measurements devices from the back all the way through the system. And starting at the bottom, so we'll measure the outside temperature, which is going on in the fire. We'll measure in the insulation. And we'll also actually look into the cavities. Now, many of the systems can have multiple cavities. Each one of those will be, will be instrumented. And the fire load is a large timber crib. Each crib consists of about 250 sticks, or is 250 sticks, and we control the um, moisture content of the wood, which means the fire is consistent. There are, other European, there are other test methods available. Some use gas burners. There has been suggestion of using pool fires, but timber cribs do have an advantage in that if you need to put the system out, actually timber cribs are quite straightforward to put out. You haven't got the other hazards of gas systems, unburnt gas, or dealing with a pool fire if you've got structures or debris coming down off a uh, cladding rig. 
which is on fire. So the method chosen was to use a uh, timber crib. And a crib output, some figures, 4,500 megajoules and about three megawatts peak output. Now that is actually the size of a small car fire. Modern cars have got a lot more plastics in them, they're quite a bit bigger. So three megawatts is about the size of a small car fire. Is that plus or minus 5 or 0.5? Sorry? Is that plus or minus 5 or 0.5? No, it should be 0.5. Yeah, it can't be right, can it? I'll have to check that. <coughs> it's about 3 meg. We wouldn't go. <laughs> so you've got a large crib fire, 3 megawatts, sitting in the bottom. The The crib is igniting and allowed to burn. You probably reach peak output of the crib after about five to 10 minutes, at which point the test is well underway and you are starting to involve the uh, material on the outside of the <coughs> cladding system. Here you can see photographs of a fire test. These are actually taken at BRE Cardington. and We've already got flames off the top of the rig. Looking at the right hand picture, you've got loss of facade material, probably most of that's either burnt away or on the floor, and you've also got remaining burning on the surface there. The systems are subjected to the full, full, full fire load for 30 minutes, at which point we actually put the cribs out and monitor for another 30 minutes to see what happens. So it is a large test and the systems do go through, it is a, quite an onerous test. On completion of the testing, we look at the amount of damage that has been done. Uh, we look at sort of like flame spread on the surface. We look for the effects. <coughs> flame spread in cavities or the insulation. When you have some of the lower mel melting point insulations, this can form cavities during the test. We're interested in the progression of fire in these areas. Areas of fa facade that are damaged or detached, I has the lot come crashing down to the floor, have you had sort of like debris on the floor, have you had burning droplets coming down, have pool fires developed off the system or materials that are currently burning. And the primary pass fail criteria that's recommended in approved document B is something called BR135 and essentially what it says is there's a level of thermocouples around here and it says during the fire all those thermocouples need to remain below 600 degrees and the actual fire at the failure point is if those thermocouples go above 600 degrees and stay there. So we're looking at the system right from the external all the way back through and row of instrumentation and what we're actually looking for is whether it goes above 600 degrees at that level. Uh, because historically that's sort of like flame temperature. I know it's, that's deemed as flame temperature, lower end of flame temperature. Um, it's quite interesting when you watch the test that actually you can tell when a system's not going to get through because you see the flames hitting the thermocouples. And from a test engineer point of view, you can look at it and say, well, that's not. But if, even if the flames are a little bit away, you can, as the test progresses, you can, you've got a pretty fair idea of temperature. By the time they do hit 600 degrees, especially on the outside, um, there's a lot going on. That's quite a long way up. Those thermocouples are about five metres off the top of the half. Typical level two, ex so we've got a graph there of the thermocouples. I don't know how clear this is on the screen, but we're peaking there at about 400 degrees. So we're five metres up above the half you've got thermocouples that are hitting 400 degrees. If you start to involve the system, if, you start to, if the system starts to burn, then those temperatures are going to be higher. System under test. Um, series of three photographs to start with early in the test. You can see the crib's pretty well grown. The flames coming out of the hearth. You're up to, you're probably touching the level one thermocouples in the right hand photograph very early in the test 
as fire progresses, obviously there's progressive damage to the system. Fire will get in behind the facade. You may have other materials burning there. Your front facade material may come away exposing insulation and you get a progressive failure of the system throughout the test. The last one on the right is the system looks is sort of like ignited completely. You've probably got all the fuel there going, facade materials falling away, and you've got insulation material burning for the full height of the rig. A couple of photographs. These these are quite old, but they illustrate the point um, about structure and the way things are put together and the way uh, things like fire break and engineering of the system can, can quite markedly change the result. The system here was an expanded polystyrene te system tested. So you've got the aftermath of the fire on the left. Essentially, the whole system has burnt back. You can see exposed block work there. There's remains of the material melted back onto the block work uh, and obviously you've had burning all the way off the top of the rig. Would that material have had an outer render or something yeah. like that? There would have been a mesh or a render or some sort of system on there. The system on the right is the same insulation <coughs> but they've got fire breaks in there. So you can see at the level one your insulation has been damaged as you progress up, you've got another fire break there. That would be a mineral wall fire break. And your damage there is considerably less when compared to this sort of system. And this is the same sort of insulation material. And that, you, so the surface we're looking at there, is that, is that a render we're looking at? No, the, that's, damage, no, that's that EPS. Okay. It's polystyrene. Okay. So, proper, so an engineer system where You've got fire breaks, you prevent the fire spreading, you prevent the fire growth by restricting the amount of fuel that's getting into the fire, uh, and you get a markedly different result. And again, getting back to the start of the uh, discussions and conversations, the 84142 test is now looking at. Um, Rain screen systems and the more modular build or the new build that's in layers. <coughs> same fire load, same metho methodology as BS 8414 Part 1, but the systems are built differently. So, in this case, you've probably got some sort of um, possibly a cement particle board, but you'll have plaster board on the inside representing the inner surface of your accommodation, and then you've got the various membranes, layers, and that is, I would guess, a carrier system for a facade. And this is the sort of thing that we're now testing. This photograph here is a much later one because this is at the burn hall at BRE. We're currently testing systems and a lot of systems for building regulations in the UK. Um, United Arab Emirates and the Gulf States, there's a lot of interest in fire tests. Getting back to, they've had a number of fire tests out there. This test method, the 8414, is being adopted in other parts of the world as well. We understand that China uses a method, this sort of test method. Um, and th this test method is called up by a number of uh, bodies or around the world in their equivalence to approve document B. We're currently operating third-party approvals under the LPCB brand. So from a third-party point of view, or an insurance point of view, or should you require a higher performance of the system, the pass-fail, because it's separate from the test standard, and that's the practice now with most European testing standards, the pass-fail criteria can be set by the local regulator, which is different to BR135. So for insurance purposes, we actually have a higher pass-fail rate, which has been agreed with the insurer, uh, UK insurance industry. And what they're actually... Do you say higher, do you mean more onerous? Yes. 
And what they actually ask for for UK insurance is that you don't hit the 600 degrees uh, until 30 minutes. So you cannot go above 600 degrees for the 30 minutes of the test. Whereas a BR135 says you can't go across 600 degrees for the first uh, 15 minutes. So by this methodology, a local regulator can use the test standard, but you can then have a system where your pass fail is increased. You could have requirements for flaming droplets, you could have requirements for pool fires, you can have requirements for debris coming down. I know for the Australian market, they're particularly interested in the amount of debris coming off buildings, and they're currently, their documentation uses this test method that regulates for the debris coming off and the mass of debris. This is a good source of information and this is where the approved document B, this is the BR135 and this gives essentially the pass fail that's, re that's recommended or in approved document B. And what they're actually looking for is to prevent the fire spread. So they restrict the uh, temperatures at level two to 600 degrees. You can't go above 600 degrees in the first 15 minutes. And by the end of the test, um, the fire shouldn't have gone out, shouldn't be above the top of the rig. So that's the current recommendations in approved document B. But we also report on everything else. So if we have debris falling off in the test reports and the classification reports, we report on that. If we have pool fires developed, collapse, that sort of thing, that's what we will do. This is reported in the classification documents. Thank you very much. I probably went through that a bit quicker than I expected, but there's my contact details, including the phone number. I'm quite happy to open up di discussions and try and answer any questions that you may have. I'm just going to get a mic here. Anybody, any questions? Uh, the, the reason why it spread so fast was the material on the outside was combustible. It got to a certain temperature, there was a certain fire size, at which point... And would it, the ambient temperature of the location of the material have anything sorry? to do... Sorry? The ambient temperature, so the, where the building and material is located, have anything to do with the reason that it might have been a faster spread of, of the rate of fire? Uh, I, I don't think so. I, don't, I haven't got the details in that case, but that is sort of like a classic example of your material on your front facade of your building being combustible. And yeah. as soon as you have it in that orientation, you've got rapid fire spread. Yeah. So you've actually caught something in the material on the outside and it's just progressing. The fire brigade can only reach <coughs> certain heights with pumps and yeah. things like that as well. So as soon as it goes above a certain height, then there's a lot of challenges for the fire service. Absolutely, and you, and you showed um, an incredible picture there with the, with the difference between the fire breaks and no fire breaks. Yeah. In relation to that particular hotel, and even the Azerbaijan one, was there any fire breaks in the installation at all? I don't know, but if you think about it, so you, <laughs> sorry, I'll go back, but your fire breaks are not external. So on that system there, what you would have is a decorative layer over it. Mm. Now if that decorative layer is combustible or flammable, it will just go straight past your fire. Just right? miss it all together, yeah. It will just go up the front face of the building. Your fire brakes, essentially in that case, your fire brakes will work because your front decorative layer has actually stayed in place as well and provided protection for the systems underneath. Mm. So it's your fire brake and that. If the fire can go back up the outside, then it's what you're dealing with is fire in the materials on the outside of the building. Thank you. Do we know, uh, or do you know what, um, if that building was um, supposedly built in accordance with any particular code, UK codes or um, NFPA codes in relation to the external surfaces, or was it just an ad hoc? 
I, I don't know. There are the investigations underway at present on that, and I think, it, in fairness, we should go back to the authorities who, to have a look at the performance and the materials and see what lessons they've learned from it. Yeah, but I, but I just I can't, I'm not actually sure of the full data on that, but to say that it was designed by FBA sounds a bit strange to me because it wouldn't be, it was PUR was using that as my understanding. And uh, this PUR is now that's effectively banned, I believe, in the UAE. Or it's their top, they've talked about it anyway. Yeah, it's so it's, what, what confuses me there, you said that the outside of the building is combustible, okay? My understanding was it was something like an aluminium or some sort of metal on the outside, rather than a combustible piece. But what was combustible was the PUR on the inside. That's why it's usually polyethylene, I think, isn't it? Is it the? <coughs> I don't know the details, but if you see, I, I'm yeah, not, but it would be easy nice. enough for the, you see that the point is that the outside metal piece, let's say it was metal, or if it was, I'm not saying it wasn't polyethylene, so I don't know the detail. But I know many of these other fires have studied that it's actually it's the outside material has not been combustible in the sense that no. oh, it, it will probably pass a surface spread of flame, but if it's penetrated yeah. or delaminated, That's right. and then the insulation becomes, because it, like something like aluminium will give away so quickly, right? Yep. It'll delaminate, and then the inside combustible material goes up, but to say, I, I'm not so sure I'd agree that that thing was NFPA designed. I'd be very surprised at that. But I don't, I'm not sure. But that's that. the point I was trying to make about the size of the fire in the if you this is why the European framework and the regulators in the UK go for an A2 classification because you do have this effect if you've got a very thin outer layer they can go through some of the Euro class testing some of the surface spread of flame class O um, but in that case it's but some of those systems the outer aluminiums yes. what 0.9 it's worth nothing yeah, right. so essentially it is your surface material with a little bit of protection on the outside that's got... Can, just, just for clarification, I might say that, you know, it would be contradicted, but if you had a, effectively a non-combustible aluminium on the outside, but you had inside something like uh, an improved <coughs> PIR or, you know, or indeed a rock wall or something of that nature, that wouldn't have happened to that extent. But yeah, I thought maybe if you. It was PUR, yeah. which is polyurethane. Right. So if it's, it's going to burn like hell right up the thing, you know, once it, once it takes off. Yeah, if that was an aluminium system over uh, a different insulation, no, you, you would have a different result. Yeah, in terms of all the openings from the internal <coughs> and external, say, like windows, windows and the like. Yep. There are obviously. Controls over the external um, surface of, of the cladding material. Yep. But the weak point is actually the if there's a, two materials like an inner leaf and an outer leaf. Yep. How you close how you close that that cavity. In systems you've tested, um, have you have you seen manufacturers who placed a particular emphasis on reinforcing that cavity closure? Yep. What they do is they treat that as a window reveal, mm. and it's actually quite important that they do treat that detail there uh, with care really and when we report we always report we do report on that detail there because that should be representative of a window yeah. because the actual fire is representative of a flashed over room coming out of an accommodation up the front of the uh, building and have you tested t two identical systems but well nearly identical where the difference was the manner in which that cavity was closed and was the difference very much apparent? Um, so is that a fair question? Can you explain that again, Paul? It, is it such an obvious weak point in, in the overall external envelope? It is, but if... I'm just trying to think if it's... So you've got a... It did, see, a lot of this is it's supposed to be, it's supposed to represent how the manufacturer is putting the system on the walls or how the installer. So there's just quite a lot of variation in the system. I, I'm not aware of actually doing back to back where the fire stopping around that reveal has been changed and we've that's not been done and published. So manufacturers might have done it, but that's not something we can discuss because all the Testing's confidential, yeah. but there's nothing 
I'm not aware of anything where we've published, where we've done that sort of research work, looked at that detail in, looked at that aspect of it in great detail. Have any of your tests involved windows or simulated windows or even fire retardant, or sorry, Jeremy, fire resistant glass on the outside of buildings? Right. Or is the, that part of any of the tests? For the glazing, there was that publication. Sorry. You're okay. There. Okay. So the one on the right, but we don't test on the current 8414 and current facade test, we don't test with windows because we're looking at fire spread in the materials. Okay. We're not, we know a window will fail. So what we're actually looking at is fire spread via the materials on the outside facade. Okay. Just from a practical point of view, when, um, in accommodation, windows will be open during the summer. Mm. So we just, it's not been included. We just look okay. at the performance of the facade. Okay, thanks. So I'm sorry, how does that, the, the, the guidance document on the right-hand side, how does that test compare with the one? So what are, you, what are you testing for in that situation? They were actually looking at um, glazed facades and the current test method come out of both those bits of work. I don't know what the, just have a look at the dates on those. So they were both, the one on the right was around 99. So the BS8414 was like, come out of those, this, this set of research. And so it was, it was basically a piece of research. And was there any findings that are kind of have been incorporated into codes from that? Um, the honest answer to that is I don't know, because yeah. it's a bit before my time. But they, both those documents are still available, really. So. Um, Could you touch on the, the 15 minutes versus 30 minutes? Uh, uh, temperature rise, of, you know, yep. above six, uh, 600 degrees again, just to right. see why you would favour one stat, one level okay. over another. We've got two sets of instrument. When we run the test, we've got a set of instrumentation at level one. Yeah. And that is basically tells us how the fire's progressing. Mm. And those thermocouples are invariably in the flames because of their location. So when the fire starts out of combustion chamber, they'll exceed those level one thermocouples, but that gives us a measurement to start the test and do all the calculations. We've got a set of thermocouples at level two. Now they go outside, so they're actually visible, but we also bury them within the structure. So if we have fire spread up the cavities, we can measure that. Within the cavity. And what the current requirement is for BR135 is that they stay below 600 degrees within the first 15 minutes. And that will give you what they call your BR135 classification, providing it doesn't go off the top of the rig. What you've actually got is progressive failure of these systems due to the fire. Okay. But then, it, it, what is it, the... The part B that that uses a 30 minute figure? No, there's insurance requirements yes. because the insurance industry are interested in property protection. Approved document B is all about life safety. Mm. So BS8414, BR135, approved document B, it's about life safety. Once, if that's dealt with, then as far as British government's concerned, their job's done. The insurance industry are after property protection and after an increased level of performance. So for the UK insurance industry, what they're looking for is for those thermocouples there to stay below 600 for 30 minutes or until the hoses go on the crib. A lot of, a lot of systems will meet the BR135, i.e. those level two thermocouples will stay below 600 degrees in the first 15 minutes but at 25 minutes or 27 minutes, the flames spread up past that level and it's progressing up through the systems. It just makes it, it just delays, the, it just gives you a measure for the fire spread within the systems. If it's taken 30 minutes to hit 600 degrees up the top, then that's slower fire progression.
Okay. Any more questions? It's naive to ask a question along the lines of if you were to give a manufacturer a couple of very quick, clever tips as to how to make a good system, what, what, would, what would you be looking for? Well, I think we can't. Well, we've got systems that we've listed that met the insurance requirement that are based on render and EPS. Um, I can't name names, but I've also seen problems with systems that you wouldn't expect to have problems. It comes down to the materials, <coughs> their design. Um, it, it's it's not something I can really say. Or it's hard to say, really. So a system with expanded polystyrene can meet the 30 minutes, uh, 600, but other systems that you'd expect to cause far fewer problems. Uh, <coughs> so a lot of it's about the engineering, the way they treat the fire breaks, and essentially getting back to this point, it's if you've got your floor slab and your system on the outside, that's pretty key really how that performs sorry just a quick question again about you know the A2 class <coughs> classification yep is that a result of that large large scale test no, no you've got two sets of tests you've sorry. got Euro classes 13501 which is pan European testing and what they're actually saying is if you've got an A for the approved document B if you've got an A2 it means that the materials are inherently limited combustibility the way they're tested, because they're ground up small and burnt in oxygen, you know it's homogeneous, you know the amount of energy you get out of it, you know you're not going to get that. It's, it's fundamental, you just won't get that sort of fire spread. So they're giving you two routes via to proof document B. You can either use that A2, but any polymeric <coughs> material, any plastic material, you cannot get A2 on. So any of your foams and things like that, they will just would not get A2. So you've got large scale testing methodology where you look at the structure in the system as a whole. I'm from the property insurance business and again property insurers are, are, are concerned about not having to write large checks. It, speaking just in very general terms about construction systems rather than a particular brand, what are the ones that s tend to survive better? Can you give a sort of a general sort of an answer? about the, what is likely to survive better um, uh, in, in the real world scenario? Um, well, Concrete, I suppose, but I mean, apart from that. Yeah, I mean, you, could, you can start with blockwork construction, yeah. you can go, I mean, anything that's inherently A2, yeah. A1, A2, you're not going to have this issue. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of this insulation materials that are A1, A2. They they will inherently not burn. There's products being used. I mean, mineral wool. They use them as fire stops within the systems. But as I said, as soon as you get to sort of like the insulation materials that can't be A2, then they can do the 30 minutes, providing they're engineer, engineered correctly and designed correctly. The engineer, the correct engineering is the is the key thing. Yes. I, just, I, I might just hijack things slightly here for a moment. It, it just uh, as a general guideline, uh, if you're involved in any design work or construction projects, it is worthwhile bouncing your proposals off the insurer because if you get things wrong, you could end up causing your client problems with insurance or maybe cause their insurance to be more costly than it otherwise would be um, for the life of the building. Sorry, I, just, I had to say that. Okay. okay. Any more questions? In that case, can I ask you to show your appreciation to Stephen the Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you very much.